far, far from wipers I long to be Where German snipers can't get at me Damp is my dugout, cold are my feet Waiting for whiz bangs to send Thank you, my dear. I see you've got a letter. Yes. Any good news about... No. Well, nothing. Wilfred can't tell us much, even if he knows himself. But the paper says it'll all be over in days. Papers says. May I read it? I will read it afterward. I don't suppose there's any sign of those two youngsters. Goodness knows what they're going to do after this. And as for Wilfred. Oh, good morning, Father. Oh, good morning to you, young lady. We're just asking after you and your young brother. Any sign of him? I, I haven't seen him yet, Father. Well, you two are having it nice and easy at the moment, but after this you have to settle down to something worthwhile, eh? Well, sit down, sit down, girl. Have your breakfast. I have work to do. So I'll see you this evening, my dears. Yes, Tom. Goodbye, Father. Bye. Mother, can I read the letter now? Yes, of course, my dear. But have some tea first. No, nothing in the letter. Your father seems to be worried about after the war. 
But for heaven's sake, let's get the war all over with first. Then we will be rejoicing, not, I think, worrying. We will be praying to God and giving thanks for the safe return of our dear Wilfred. Yes, of course, Mother. He will come back, won't he? He will come back. And he will be a hero and he will be a poet. He is a poet, Mother. He already is a poet. Your famous son, my famous brother, think of that. I think of it, I think of it. You know I do. It is our great family purpose. Well said, my dear. It is our purpose and our life. And your life. My life. Well, you are one of the family. Mother, can we read the letter now? Yes, my dear, let's. You read it. You will understand I could not write when you think of us for days all but surrounded by the enemy. All one day after the battle we could not move from a small trench, though hour by hour the wounded were groaning just outside. Three stretcher bearers who got up were hit, one after the other. I had to order no one to show himself after that, but remembering my own duty and remembering also my forefathers, the agile Welshmen of the mountains, I scrambled out myself and felt an exhilaration in baffling the machine guns by quick bounds from cover to cover. After the shells we had been through and the gas, bullets were like the gentle rain from heaven. I had managed to get hold of a machine gun myself, a Lewis, and managed to take a number of prisoners from the enemy trench. It had become a bit isolated from the rest, but fortunately the main party withdrew after that and we managed to extricate ourselves. Then we went back for a day's rest to bring up some reinforcements. Some of them look pretty scared already, poor victims, though I must stand before them and promulgate this general order. Peace talk in any form is to cease. It is to cease in the Fourth Army. All ranks are warned against the disturbing influence of dangerous peace talk. Mother, is there no end in sight? They can't even talk of peace. Commander asked me to do the evening brief while he's away at battalion. Oh. Have you been drinking, Curtis? Gallons of stuff. <laughs> Haven't you? 
Well, I can't write to occupy my mind, can I? You could, Kirky. <laughs> something. I could do something, but not write. And that something is not something I could do here. Kirky, are you sure you're all right? Well, f you're all right. You're the only one of us that is now, you know that? You're the officer we'd all like to be, but none of us is. I'm not an officer, Kirky, not here. I'm not a professional soldier or a professional officer. The war's made you one, a very good one. Even if you are, as you say, not a professional one. Besides, what is an officer if not one who does the job in war? How do you know you're not one? What, who, why? Questions not for here and now, Kirky. Wolf, I'm so tired, so exhausted, utterly. Sometimes I fear if I fall asleep, I'll never wake up again from sheer exhaustion. <laughs> it has overtaken fear, you know. How can an officer concentrate on his job? How can we lead our men? Keep going, old son. I try to. I try to think this will all be over soon. And, and then we, those of us who are left, that is, will be... Don't say it. Don't look or think beyond this. I know, I know. That way lies madness. Hope. Trust. We cannot possibly have that. But this will all be over soon. This will all be over, Wilf. <laughs> we'll be over. True then, Mr. Owen, is it, or another officer lied? Evening, sir, Major. Gentlemen. You know all about the officers and their lies. You know it all, so don't put me to the test. Rumours, sir, rumours. But from you, we expect the truth. Why me? Because you, sir, are a true gent, an English gent, someone we expect to be an officer. Not a drunken bastard of a liar who tells everybody to go over the top, cowers down until somebody leads the way, hiding behind their backside, maybe shoot themselves in the foot, get a blighty one. No, sir, you're the real thing. And you're a poet, a soldier, an officer, and a poet. Well, gentlemen, forget all that now. How are we doing? We got all the company here? Oh, and Baldy, you don't need to prepare my supper. We've got grub coming up, haven't we, Q? Well, I've got to go back for it so after this briefing. Where are you going to set up the cookhouse? Well, sir, Mr. Kirk here's got a good location, and all the uh, platoons will come and collect their hay boxes when they're ready. I, I don't want people stumbling about in the dark with hay boxes, particularly if the Bosch decide to chuck some gas over. Uh, which reminds me, everyone sleeping in respirators, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Very good, sir. Come on, gentlemen, it makes sense. Baldy, what are you looking for now, exactly? These are your poems, sir. I want to show them to the lads. They've been talking about you, especially after the last show, we started all the posh with the Lewis. Don't even say it. And if you must share some poetry, don't use that book. You can show them this one, if you like. Thank you, sir. And don't cop it, because if you do, we'll just leave your useless body and take the notebook. Well, if I die, sir, I'll put it in this pocket here so you know where to find it. <laughs> oh. You uh, mentioned the unmentionable word. Now we know you're gonna. Well, maybe I'll cop a blighty one. Yeah, and while I'm in the casual clearing station, we'll all be on the train going home. <clears throat> Come on, gentlemen, enough of this superstitious stuff. Well, Hugh, you better be going back to Battalion HQ and getting the grub. Is it going to be ready? Yeah, it should be, sir. It's only about 300 yards to QM's base. You want a hand, Q? Oh, no, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. But I've uh, got a new storeman, sir, since poor old Bert bought it the day before yesterday. Gave Q one of my second lane, young Starkey. I thought you were going to make him your batman. Uh, he would rather go with Q. So who is doing your batman? No one at the moment. Well, need someone to look after you, sir? I'll come down and I'll sort you out somewhere. No need, Sergeant Major, honestly. Go down there, Sergeant Major. Don't give them a blast, just chippy them a little. Get them to rally round Mr. Kirk. I'll do that, sir. Well, you, you better get going. And we'll expect you in an hour or so? Yes, sir. Well, then tell us, Mr. Owen. 
When are we getting the blighty boat, eh? When's this all going to be over? There'll be another show. You know that. Baldy, what are you doing? Just practicing, sir. Want to read these to the lads? Don't you think Mr. Owen should be the one to read them? Uh, maybe before the final show. Baldy, this is not Henry V before Agincourt. <laughs> I know. Shakespeare. Stirring stuff. Rallying the troops. Fucking schoolboy soldiers, sir. I know your stuff is not like that. And what is it like? And what will it do to the troops, Baldwin? I, um, I, I don't know. But you have an opinion, Private Baldwin? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sorry, sir. I like to be addressed by my title. Kind of got used to it since Mr. Owen started calling me that. All right, lad, come on. Enough of that soppy stuff. Come on, just spit it out. What do you want to say? Well, it's not soppy stuff. That's part of it. But in these, in these poems, it's like he's talking to us, like he's one of us, but at the same time, like he's talking to the world about this. This. And is it stirring? Does it make you want to fight on until the end? Yes. Mm. No, but it helps and it makes me feel kind of uh, proud. Well, will it do that to the lads? I, I don't know. I don't know. Well then, Wolf, what's your opinion? You wrote the poems. You must know what it'll do to the lads. What are you trying to say? Trying to say to the lads. Am I in a pulpit? Am I preaching? No. I am an officer in this army. I did not choose that. This war chose that for me. I chose to be a poet. In my duty as an officer, yes, maybe I must preach or even teach. Had I the tools to tell them how to do their duty and win their piece of battle? I have been asked by the king, whose commission I hold, to keep my men in order and to follow the orders of my superior officers. But to do so without teaching would, would just be the tragedy of blind obedience. My duty as a poet is not only to my soldiers, but to others who might themselves choose to read my poems. Them I cannot deceive. They will find me out and cast aside my work as that of a fraudster and a cheat. But perhaps it is my soldiers who know me. You all know me, who will be the best judge. So I certainly mustn't deceive you and my superior officers who judge me even though they do not know me as you do. Well, I can't deceive them either. I wish only to tell all what I see and how I see it. All must know not only what has happened here, but how to view it. They are blind, and their eyes must be opened. There is, there is an experience here which no human being has undergone before, and all must be taught about it. So that when it comes to happen again, someone, somewhere, might stop it in time. Rum, sir! Might be a bummin' hole. Oh, who's up, sir? It's me, Baldy. I've got the rum ration. What's up, Baldy? Keep you out of the officer's mess, have they? You know me, Corp. Never there. Mr. Owen's Batman. Yeah, I know. And you've been taking care of the company officers in their bunker as well. Well, give us the grog then. What about the grub? Never got it. Well, you need to get kicked up the arse then, son, because we was told you... Something happened to Q. I think he brought it in the way back from Battalion HQ. But the grog bowled him, the rations. This is the first time we've been in a decent billet whilst in the front line, and we're looking forward to a decent meal. I never got it, but I got something else instead from Miss Drowin. What you got then, Baldy? Piece of silver from the officer's mess, is it? <laughs> you booger! The officer's mess, as you call it, is a rat infested cellar. No bigger than this one. No! I've got his poems. <laughs> <laughs> 
Poems? Oh, you little shit. You are slicking little shit. That's all you're good for, isn't it? Wiping officers' asses. Poems now? Fuck's sake. Fucking officers. I tell you what, had my way. I can shoot every last one of them. That's his calling in life, to write poems. <laughs> you're not a professional soldier, but your calling is to kill people with that rifle. And I'll inspect that rifle later as well. So best be clean. You don't know, Balder. You've only been out here a couple of weeks and suddenly Mr. Owen chooses you for his Batman. But officers get shot by their men. And they shoot men as well, if you don't go over the top when the show is on. The difference is, you'll get shot for doing it to them. And they won't get nothing for doing it to you. Not in this battalion court. We've got good morale here. <laughs> morale? Morale? What do you know about morale? You're not a professional soldier. What, you heard the officers talking, have you? Heard them talking about morale? We've got to keep the morale up with the traps. Discipline's where to do that, eh, what? <laughs> you heard them talking about it, haven't you? But you don't know what it means. Well, I can't quite put it into words. Well, if you can't put it into words, try just one word then, instead of morale. All right then. Happiness. <laughs> <laughs> happiness. You're happy to be here then, eh? Oh, don't worry, we'll leave you here. No, I didn't find happiness like that, Corporal. Stand to, stand to, officer on parade. Where's your sentry, Corporal Jones? You men need to be more alert. Sorry, sir. Didn't see you, sir. Look, we're not finished yet. Please maintain your discipline. I wanted to let you know. Hughes bought it, I'm afraid. Shell took him out, and the old horse as well. But what about the grub, sir? Well, unless you want to be scraping it up from the mud with horse entrails. Well, at least we'd know he was eating horse then, instead of the rumours. <laughs> oh well, pack lunch again then, lads, eh? You've been spying on us, sir. Maybe write one of your poems about us. You've been listening before we came down. I don't need to spy on you to write about you, Mr. Jackson. They're all about you anyway. You're a professional soldier. The rest of you are just here for the war, like myself. But they're about you all, and for you all. Do you think it'll be over soon, sir? And them guns will stop? Because it's like you say, they make fools of us, a lot of us. You are all worth something. Oh, come on, they're not worth nothing. They're just stupid. Stupid? Sometimes I think maybe we all are stupid. Stupid blind fools. Speak for yourself, sir, as an officer like. Don't you think you're the fools? Fools? Possibly. When will it be over, though, sir? It's, it's like... It's like... A, like you say, they're making us, making fools of us. It will be. It will be. And your poems will be like a memorial to us, sir, won't they? We'll go then, sir. For God's sake, put us out of our misery. Read one. Let's hear something to cheer us up. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks. Knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshot. All went lame, all blind. Drunk with fatigue, death even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling. Fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim, through misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. See, that's what happened to you lot if you don't put those bloody things on. <coughs> Was it the cockpit, sir? Did one of them last lot that went over the top before? It's not a bit of tennis, is he? 
Yeah, it's right at home, sing bloody war hero. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If, in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear, at every jolt, the blood come gargling from froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cut of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend. You would not tell, with such high zest, to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie. Dolce a decorum est pro patria mori. Well, that did cheer us up. Thanks, sir. <laughs> well, men are cheer you up, you mugs. So men tell you how it really is. Tell everyone at home, the old men, and the old women, and the wives and the kids, how it really is. Because none of them know. And all will they, except for this sort of thing. So was it fucking Latin then? You know, that last bit. Just when I was getting a bit interested. <laughs> well, that started with the Romans, didn't it? <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know, I read it in some paper, fucking local rag, um, something about dying, dying for your country. It is sweet and right for your country to die. For your country to die? No, for you to die for your country. It's a lie. Of course it's a lie. A goddamn fucking lie. Well said, Mr. Owen. At least one officer can talk some sense. Take some, take poetry to, to talk sense and all, doesn't it? Well, just to talk reality, talk at all. You have dragged an army out of dumbness, given a voice to the fore in every Tommy's mind. Those of us that had minds. Just because we die like that, don't mean we ain't got minds. An animal's got a mind. That's why they cry out when they're killed. That's not their mind. That's just pain. I can't bear it, me, when they're mortars, when they're mortars die. Well, it's their voice, the only voice they got. And when we die, it's the only voice we got as well. But now, Mr. Troy, I think you might well have given us a different voice. Talking of animals, you can read this one if you want. What, me, sir? Ain't got your voice for it. Don't think I can. Try it. There's no Latin in this one. Hey, go on, Jacko. What passing bounds for these die? as cattle. Only the monstrous anger of the guns. Only the stuttering rifles, rapid rattle, can patter out their hasty horizons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs wailing shouts and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all, not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes, shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of your brow shall be their fall, their flowers the tenderness of patient minds, and each slope does a drawing down a blind. Oh, I toyed around with a few different titles, but a friend suggested Anthem for Doomed Youth. Doomed. They're all doomed. What about this word, sir? Horizons. Is it like orifice? <laughs> no. Um, Orison is a funeral prayer. I know when my orifice starts twitching, you lot better be saying some orisons. <laughs> The only orisons you'll be saying when your orifice starts twitching will come out brown and liquid and extremely stinky, Private Turner. Well, it's me that read it. Do I have to ask Tom to an opinion? I will say, I hate officers. Everyone here knows that. You are man first and foremost. And this ain't about officers. This ain't officer speak. 
Sides, you did a good job in that last show when you took the Lewis and slotted a few Bosch. So I reckon she was one of us. And this is about all of us. And now, Miss Drawing, I think you might have just made us into, well, giants. Not sodding heroes, not brave, but somebody. So long as somebody remembers me, you know where we, I mean, I cop it. Before you said we died like cattle. Worse than that, because you can eat cattle. We were just worthless rubbish. But we all want to be remembered. And now I know we will. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh, oh you got one of them, you old bastard. I never knew. Ah, of yours. <laughs> you can play. I can sing as well, we all can. If you want to find the sergeant, I know where he is. We know where he is. We know where he is. If you want to find the sergeant, we know where he is. He's been thieving all the Tommy's rum. We've seen him, we've seen him. Thieving all the Tommy's rum. We've seen him, we've seen him, thieving all the Tommy's run. If you want the old battalion, we know where they are. We know where they are. We know where they are. If you want the old battalion, we know where they are. They're hanging on the old barbed wire. We've seen them, we've seen them. Hanging on the old barbed wire. We've seen them, we've seen them. Hanging on the old barbed wire. What about this one? We all know this one. Good boy, good boy. Wipe the tear, baby dear, from your eye. Though it's hard to part, I know. Oh, be. Tickle to death to go, don't cry, don't sigh. There's a silver lining in the sky. Bonsoir, old thing, cheerio, chin chin. Now poo to the loo, goodbye. <laughs> now, Brother Wilfred went away <laughs> to do his bit the other day with a smile on his lips. And he left seven pips on his shoulders, bright and gay. As the train pulled out, he said, Remember me, Swarm Bird? <laughs> That's enough, Private Jackson. You are on a charge for insubordination to an officer, namely, addressing a aforementioned officer by his Christian name. I will deal with you tomorrow, Jackson. Captain? Thank you for coming. Oh, I gather you've drawn the short straw to lead the brigade. And as I'm sure the um, brigade majors told you, we're up for what might be the final show. No promises, mind, and incidentally, this doesn't leave this from and particularly not in any letters home. So we're making sure that the censorship people are doing their thing. But things are moving quite quickly now, so what we have to do is to keep in line with advances made across the core front. Yes, Brigadier. Well, I trust your men are settled in, fed, watered, in bivouacs or cellars, eh? Right, well, it's the uh, canal, Sombre, of course. I gather you've been down there with CO 16 flats. Yes, I have, sir. 
Well, I want the whole brigade over. I'm ready to move forward as a formation. I don't want to be delayed or weakened for any subsequent operations. Well, <coughs> intelligence on the canal shows it to be substantial. Some 70 feet wide or so, 8 to 10 feet deep. It's full at the moment. Well, there's a, a lock and oars here. Now, all the bridges in the vicinity have been destroyed. I've been down there. It was at night. You can't get there in daylight. Not to the actual bank. Well, the Bosch snipers will have you, will have you pinged straight away. But uh, it is a substantial obstacle, straight, clear, with no cover on either side. The trees, of course, have been completely torn away. Uh, there is a continuous bank up to the water's edge, which does give some cover. But once on the canal bank itself, uh, there is no cover whatsoever. Now, as to the actual location of the Bosch, well, it's safe to say that they occupy the opposite bank. Uh, they are sitting overlooking the water, and there's high ground uh, they're bound to have some heavy weapons dug in up there. Now, I'm sure they brought up some uh, engineer stuff to uh, build the trenches up uh, and maybe build the mound up so they look directly across. Uh, and there'll be wire and mines as well, right onto the water's edge. Intelligence indicates that the banks on either side are fairly narrow. So assuming that, we shouldn't have that many Bosch actually overlooking our side. Also, we'll get some cover under the bank. And we've got our own sapper, eh? Oh, well, that's all very, go very well and good, Brigadier. But you know they will have machine guns aplenty overlooking the bank top, dug well in. And I really do feel that a direct assault crossing into the face of that sort of opposition is going to be downright impossible. We'll go before dawn. None of your daytime operations now. I think this brigade is well practiced for night operations. I accept that, Brigadier, and I agree. We have come a long way, but I can only say that... Yes, well, the sappers will get, her, get us across. I gather they have a cunning plan for that. <laughs> but, Brigadier... That involves throwing up pontoons across in the face of the enemy. Well, they take time and manpower to put together. And you need a secure environment. Once the uh, bridge has been taken, they can build you the best temporary bridge in the world. But in this case, in this case, it will just be a temporary pontoon walkway which every man will have to cross. Well, how many do we have for each brigade? Do you know? Just the one. I thought of battalion. I thought as much. The point of the battalion will cross almost in single file. Even if we get the bridges done, as troops cross, they will simply be cut down. Fire plan, guns, we will have a fully resourced mortar and artillery fire plan for this. They will cover the bridges pre-HR, we set HR for the first crossing. Well, could we not go back to Brigadier? Brigadier, could we not go back to Division on this and get some extra engineer resources from Corps then? Other Corps and Brigades are crossing canals. This operation will go ahead. We're nearly there. One final push. That's all I'm asking for, with you in the lead. Yes, Brigadier. I'll make sure the men are ready. I'm sure they will be. You've got that young Owen in your company, haven't you? Why didn't you put him in the lead? I gather he did rather well the other day in a show. I want the whole brigade over, with a uh, bridgehead established, both Lang's battalions, and Northumberland's in reserve. We'll set the reserve for uh, at pause, um, with the Q elements there, the Brigade Major will do the op order and de de distribute by messenger. We set D-Day for the day after tomorrow. We're nearly there. This operation will go ahead. We'll see this through to the end, which is nigh. Well, we'll do our best, of course, <coughs> So, young Owen, you're going to put him on point. I gather he took a Lewis to the Bosch and saw off a good few of them. Uh, he did well. I'm uh, putting him up for the MC. He's a completely different officer to what he was a year ago. I'm going for the big then. Oh, no, no. Oh, quite. Probably the MC is the one. Why do you think he's changed? Well, he spent some time in an Edinburgh hospital, Craig Lockhart. It specialises in shell shock. It certainly seems to have cured him. Oh, and he writes a lot, you know, poetry and stuff. <coughs> Send it home, does it? Does he? I hope he goes through the censor. No, no, he keeps it very private. The book always open when he's on his own and closes it tight shut when anyone asks about it. There's been a lot of anti-war stuff about by these people, you know. Oh, I don't think he's one of those. Well, let's test his mettle. Put him up front, let him lead the way. And that's an order. Well, yes, Brigadier. Right, let's get on then.
Sergeant Major, march in the prisoner. Very good, sir. Prisoner and escort, attention! As you were. Prisoner and escort, attention! Quick march! Left, right, left, right, left, right, right turn, left, right, halt! Prisoner 2435987, Private Jackson, cap off! As you were, helmet off! Sir, prisoner 2435987, Private Jackson here, is charged with insubordination to an officer, namely Lieutenant Owen, that on the 30th of October he did call said officer by his Christian name of Wilfred Sir. Okay, witnesses please, Sergeant Major. <coughs> witnesses Sergeant Alcock here, sir. Sergeant Alcock, can you tell me what you know about this case? Yes, sir. Uh, well, sir, uh, we was... Um, they was, that is, uh, Mr. Owen was reading some of his uh, poems, sir. Poems? Yes, sir, his poems. And then they started singing. Uh, who did? Lieutenant Owen? No, not Mr. Owen, just some of the lads. They were singing trench songs. Then Private Jacks started a song about an officer. And he made it about Mr. Owen. And he used his name, Wilfred, sir. And are you sure that he was talking about Lieutenant Owen? Well, sir, uh, he, Mr. Owen, was the only officer in the room, in the uh, bunker. And he, Private Jackson, was looking at him and, well, sir, laughing. Uh, laughing in what way? Laughing, sir, uh, laughing in an insubordinate manner, <laughs> as he said his name, Wilfred, sir. Private Jackson, you have heard Sergeant Orcock's evidence. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, sir, it's just a song, sir, about an officer, and it goes like... Please, spare me the song. <laughs> <laughs> but you were talking about Lieutenant Owen, and you did use his name, Wilfred. Well, sir, I think of it, sir. Who's it? This to the song, sir. It wasn't about Miss Joe, but about any officer. You just put the name in it. It wasn't insubordinate, sir. Using the officer's name without addressing it with him by his proper rank was insubordinate. And apparently, you laughed as well in an insubordinate way. No, sir, I promise, sir. It wasn't in an insubordinate manner, sir. I was laughing at the song, sir. You know, it was a bit funny. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir, but calling a superior officer by his first name with or without laughter is insubordination, sir. As I said, talking to the officer, it was disrespectful to use the officer's first name without correctly addressing him by his officer rank. But uh, I think we should have to hear what uh, Lieutenant Hearn has to say about this. Is he available? You may go, Sergeant Altman. Mr. Owen, could you report to the company commander, please, sir? Ah, well, Lieutenant Hearn, you know about this case. Private Jackson is charged with insubordination in that he used your Christian name of Wilfred. Uh, that is your first name, is it not? Yes, it is, sir. I have a slight dilemma here of the possible nature of insubordination. Can you, as the victim, if you like, tell, about, tell us about it from your point of view? Well, he did use my name, sir. But it was in the context of a song which he was singing, which, like many trench songs, could be deemed, well, irreverent, I suppose, but not insubordinate. As to the use of my name, other than the song, that is, well, I understand that the military could see that familiarity could lead to an undermining of discipline. However, I think we all here know that uh, discipline in the face of the enemy is completely different to that of the parade ground and the depot during training. Uh, but the one leads to the other, so how can it be different? I am not sure. What I do know is that we all must conquer our fears. Some men come here who are afraid of the Sergeant Major, you, me, and the Corporal. Adding that fear to that of the enemy will not make them a better soldier. It might distract them from their duty, even. Also, in order to work together and be better, we must know each other. Sharing such things as songs and poetry may help us to know each other better, work better together, so that when the... Yes, yes, thank you. 
Thank you, Lieutenant Dunn. Private Jackson, in view of the upcoming show, which I think will be significant, I will dismiss this case, which is something I do not do very often. But I must stress that discipline is the cornerstone on which we carry out our operations. Without discipline, we can do nothing. So any degrading of that discipline must be stamped out. Do you understand? Yes, yes I do, sir. Definitely, sir. I'm well disciplined and will continue to be so, sir. Well, just see that you are. Case dismissed. Case dismissed. <coughs> Helmet on. <coughs> Prisoner salute. Left turn. Quick march. Left right, left right, left right, left right. Oh, you see, sir, discipline breaks down easy. You can't let it happen, sir. Yes, I hear you, Sergeant Major. But I think we are a long way from a mutiny. A happier company, <coughs> such as one is indicated by that, is more likely to fight well. Well, an undisciplined company might not fight at all. Well, as I said, I think we are a long way from a mutiny. But, Wilfred, uh, it was your poetry that started this. What have you to say about it? Well, I can truthfully say that I am not a pacifist poet, such a poet that might be said to incite mutiny or in discipline leading to mutiny. That is not, never was, and never shall be the aim of my poetry. I believe you, sir. I am not worried on that score. You are a good officer, sir, and you are good to this company. So, Wilfred, I am interested. What is the effect of your poetry? Well, I think you'd have to judge that for yourself, sir. Perhaps read some poems. I wish only to tell the pity of war. This war. The reality, in fact. Reality? Well, we don't get a lot of that around here. I will read some. I will. But we have more pressing things to uh, address now. Let's put this stuff behind us. Final show, gents, it may be. The canal, it's over there somewhere, and we have to take it. Call it the finishing line, if you will. <coughs> but we will have to cross that. Sergeant Major, get the officers and NCOs together. Wilfred, I may move my uh, bunker down here later on. You have a very comfortable cellar here. By all means, sir. Well, thank you, old man. Oh, and uh, Sergeant Major, let's have the uh, meeting in one hour or so, say. Very good, sir. Thank you. Well, you old bastard, you got away with it. I'll drink to that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Fill my mouth then, you greedy bastards. Alright then. It's weird, you never got off a charge before. Yeah, you've been on enough. I'll charge you loads of times. Yeah, remember that time I shot in the mess team? You gave me back the cue, saying if you've got to look at the food. Yeah. See how many times you've done for accidental discharge of your weapon? I've never had one of them. What? You think I'm a rubbish fucking soldier? I've never fired my weapon accidentally. I know, you got done for accidental discharge of your rifle into the back of an officer's head. That wasn't no fucking accident. <laughs> Boogle was a danger, danger to himself and to his men. <coughs> to my friends, Boogle had never been a danger to the enemy. And I didn't shoot through the back of the head. Too bleeding obvious. I got him through his equipment, sort of angle shot, so it looked like an accident. Didn't kill the bastard though, should have done. And then he wouldn't have wasted all the medic's time. Still, he has a nice permanent injury to remind himself of his war efforts. Yeah, what well, Mr. Owen, um, is he your newfound hero? I thought you hated all officers before. Man is true and genuine. Don't meet many of those hereabouts. And he has a gift, I do believe. What difference does that make here though, eh? It means I'll go and fight for him. That's the difference. What are you going to go on for? This war is nearly over. Nearly over? Nearly over? How do you know that? It's like when you're watching a game of football, isn't it? You say you're on a draw. How long does that last few minutes go on for? Seems like forever, doesn't it? You wanted to get it over, but they could score, or you could score. So all three possibilities are still open until that last whistle. That last few minutes goes on and on, don't it? Yeah, but you know a football match is going to end though, don't you? And until that end, you keep on playing. Do you want to be taken off before the final whistle? Or do you want the final whistle to go before the end of the game and leave all the players wondering what might have happened? No. I'll see this one out till the final whistle. This ain't a fucking game. Of course it's a fucking game. But we ain't the players, nor the puppet master. Merely the puppets. Now, we 
what Mr. Owen is writing and saying, well, we have something. We have a voice. He has given us that. Particularly those of us no longer here. But we've still got no choice. You wouldn't have said that at the beginning, though, would you? No, I would not have even considered it. None of us would. But now I will consider it. And I will follow Mr. Owen because he's given me some faith. Not hope, but some faith. Oh, in what exactly? I don't know, I'll tell you after the war. <laughs> uh, well, listen, you lads ought to start making yourselves scarce because Mr. Owen is coming in to do his briefing in a minute. But we want to stay, don't we, old booger? Yeah. Bit louder, lad. Do we, or do we not want to stay here by the final show of this war? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's your answer, come on. We're not moving out this nice, cosy little cellar. Yeah, you said it, little. Well, I think Company HQ are going to move in here as well, so where are you going to sleep, Private Jackson? On the floor, like I always do. Well, maybe we'll have a nice soft bed soon, eh? Are we looking forward to that, are we? Well, we'll be home. All this will be over, so of course we will. And what are you going to do then? You'll be out of a job for a start. What are you going to do? Go back to an old job? What did we do before this war? You see, we are not sure. Do we talk about that? Do we know? Do we want to know? No, because we are afraid. We won't be afraid when we get back home, will we? No more bombardments. No more snipers. No more running past gaps in trenches, worrying about getting your head shot off. No more sitting, taking a shit, wondering whether you're going to get your head shot off. Well, listen, you have spent half your life having a shit, so it's a wonder you haven't been shot there already. <laughs> but it's time yet, you wait. Shit, cool. Better get concentrated then. We aren't eat any more of that, and you will be. <laughs> However, you may want to take one now. Nowhere to go down here, though, in this cellar, is there? I'm not going out there. Well, yeah, well, when you do go, make sure you dig the shit out as far away. Not like last time when you were too scared to get away from the section of the bunkers. You lot, a bunch of fucking amateurs. You ever been in a trench full of bodies? You better have been sent to bury bodies and found them completely blocking the trench. So you had to stand on them, then show yourself and risk joining them. Have you smelt that? Have you? Listen, Jackson, not all of us are professional soldiers like you. <coughs> Some of us are just here for the party, then we're going home. For you lot, maybe. For me, it'd be the same. You've been in this war one day, one week, one year. You will be broken when you get back. Broken and rootless. You will dream of this. You will hear the bombardments when you're alone in your bedroom after the sun has gone down and the candle gone out. Who will keep you safe then, eh? No more bombardments, you say? Not true. They will stay with you and follow you around forever. And then? When you try to speak to your friends and your family, if you have any of those, they will laugh at you. They'll actually laugh at you and say, stop talking about that stupid war, it's over. But for you, it will not be over. Never. And what will we do then? You will fall into ruin and depression. And then, God help us all, you actually miss this. Can you imagine? You will actually miss being here. <coughs> we'll miss each other, yes. But not here and now. We are the here and now. There is nothing else. There is nothing outside of this war. We can only do what we are doing here. We have nothing else except each other. Whatever else there was before has now gone. You're a man without hope, Jacko. I told you, Mr. Owens, give me some faith. Not hope. There can be no hope when the world allows what's happened here. And you will go back and embrace that same rule and be rejected by it and forgotten by it all because you did your duty? What fools we are! Don't talk like that, Jacko! Men, don't get this one. Some of us will survive. <laughs> Some of us will go home. Perhaps get married, have kids, perhaps be happy. What? Time to send them off to fight in the next war? Yeah, well, maybe by then they'll give us uh, better machine guns and decent trench mortars, eh? Yeah. And better shit out of it. <laughs> well, shit is a shit wherever you do it. Even if you're doing it when you're just dying. Well, when you got to go, you got to go. Oh, these guys want to stay for your briefing, sir. It's just these two. 
Well, I can't get the whole pond to uh, do it in here. And if I did, the bottle would just walk over and chuck a few grenades down. Okay, for your section. Then Corporal Jones, Sergeant Hawcock, could you go around and brief the other sections together for me, please? And during the whole evening and night, there must be proper sentries posted. I don't want a single guard dropping. Very well, sir. And company commander is probably going to pay us a visit later. I think he just wants a dry cellar for a bit of a nap, so we won't get the whole HQ. <laughs> don't bank on it, make it a sub major as well. Well, maybe. So we need to get this briefing over with. Okay, gather around, we'll see this map, people. Okay, so, all right, so here we are. Here is the canal we have to cross. Now it's only about 500 yards from here and we'll be leaving the brigade across. We'll have sapper support. They're going to provide us with a pre-constructed bridge with some brigade pioneer troops to put it together on site and string it across the canal. It's about 70 feet across, depth about 8 feet. Now I don't think we have any giants in the platoon who can wade that, have we, Sergeant Walker? <laughs> uh, Private Jackson told me he could swim, so can't you? No heroics, okay? Now the approach is wet and low, and there's a bank up to the canal. The trees have all been blasted away, of course. Now we'll cover the sappers with your section, Corporal Jones, since you're all here. You'll need a Lewis gun up on the bank, probably to the left, but we'll confirm that at the time. And we need another Lewis on the far side as soon as the bridge that cross. We need three men from one of the other sections for that, side of the cop. I'll, uh, I'll take it across myself, sir. Uh, but where are we going to get the extra Lewis from, sir? Very good. Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> now, I have asked the company commander, sorry, begged him, for at least one more Lewis. We may not get it. In which case, we leave the one with you, Corporal Jones. It's so where the Bosch, sir. They'll be right there on the far bank, won't they? Thank you. There will probably be some Bosch this side. They've had time to prepare this defence. Now, we'll meet the engineer pioneers here. H hour for the lifting of the bombardment is no 545. By that time, your section will be in position, Corporal. The engineers will go forward and construct the bridge, and then on my order, the other sections, led by the Lewis, will cross and go firm on the other side. And Sergeant Alcock, as much ammo as possible for everyone. I know you've brought up everything you can. Uh, we got as much as the company gave us, sir, but not very much Lewis gun ammo, and few flares, grenades, and the like. And finally, everyone, as always, keep your respirators on hand. So, we're just going to charge them straight, <coughs> hopping over the canal while we do it. I thought you said we got no giants here, sir. We're all giants now, aren't we, sir? It's like, it's like Jacko said, with, with Mr. Owen's poems, they make us feel like giants, don't they? Feels like, feels like. Shut up, you old boo -boo. They're about to sleep. We'll ask for your opinion if we need it. <laughs> but, Mr. Owen, this is like madness. This is a real obstacle, and we're treating it like it wasn't there. What the fuck have we learned over these last four years? Obviously nothing. I hear you. But we are just one brigade, and the entire 4th Army is on the move here, don't forget. Also, we will have a full bombardment in support. This is going to happen, and we have to do the best we can. Are we clear on that? Yes, sir. Having said that, have you any ideas how we might approach this operation? Oars. There's a lock right there, and a bridge. We could draw the Bosch away with a huge amount of direct fire against them here, while someone is pushed across there. Once they manage to get a foothold, foot they might just be able to clear along and secure the bank. Fuck's sake, we could almost jump across at the lock. Yeah, where's the direct firepower for us then? Where's the fucking tanks? We can't even get an extra Lewis gun, even though we're the leading platoon of the fucking brigade. Yeah. <coughs> and, and some of them, and their tank mortars, we, we could do with some of them and all. But now, we need the, the heavy shit, otherwise anything we send over is just going to throw up a load of shit in the places where the Bosch aren't hiding. This is all good stuff. Unfortunately, we are but one platoon. Our duty is to do as we are told and make the very best of it. We will fight <coughs> our little battle on our terms, yes. Nobody can tell us how to do that, and I am with you boys all the way. I want your input and ideas. We will fight this together. <coughs> Sir, in the next war, can you be Commander-in-Chief? <laughs> and you can be Prime Minister and promote me for <laughs> And I would have joined the Bosch. I'd be sitting in a German tank ready to blow you all to fucking hell. Maybe marry me a nice German whore. And I'll be a toothless pensioner. 
beating you with me walking stick when you come home from leave. Commander, Bart's want to be recognised. I mean, sir, I mean, Bart's friend. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Well, welcome. You certainly have a nice place here. Uh, yes, it is, isn't it, sir? Uh, you're welcome to if you want to stay a while. Thank you. Uh, done your briefing, have you, Wilfred? Well, then, I guess it's uh, let us home, a bit to eat, and some sleep. Oh, and by the way, the village of Oz has been liberated. This is good news. We won't have any wash this side. Right, so these are just briefly on the sections. That's Sergeant Hawcock, could you please? I'll be around to visit them later. <coughs> Swallowed a bit of gas, did you, Bert? It's all right. Naturally, it's to my mother, Mr. Jackson. Are you writing home tonight? Not great. Let her write, sir. Nobody to write to, really. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm not sure there must be somebody out there thinking of you. Sir, forget the office to speak. We've, we've got beyond that now, haven't we? Yes, we have. Well, sir, this is a duty letter, isn't it? You've spoken about your duty as an officer and as a poet, although I don't really see how that can be duty. But what about your home, sir? And those you love? Love? Yes, sir, love. And don't dismiss the question, because you couldn't have written that sort of poetry if you didn't or hadn't loved. Well, I would have thought this uh, war would have brought all families close together. It has mine, and yes, I do have a loving family. Officer, speak again. Talk real, sir. OK. Answer this. Who, exactly, do you love? Well, now you're talking. And actually, that is one of the easiest questions to answer. Well, sir, so what is the answer, sir? Well, it's you. You people. You soldiers. You giants. Look at everybody! <laughs> Mr. I was in love with us! <laughs> what, what have I missed? Nothing important, sir. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going anywhere to this bombardment. Are we in the right place? Or? Yeah, we're in the right place. And they'll go with that bank there. He's so buggered for the second mate. They ought to be here. But they're in the wrong place. Shoot guard, I see. Shoot next to the wood. Didn't see a single bloke who went for these trees. Probably still sleeping. And a good rash in the run last night. Sleeping, dead for usual. Fucking story. You men leave your heads down. We're coming. Don't worry, we'll be tracking you all along. Would you assign to open heads and have a quick look along the canal? Yeah, we were looking for some of the picnic when they called the ceasefire. Oh, yeah, good to see you, boys. We thought you were the boss. That bridge really wants the doctor on. It's a little bit heavy. Not quite. It's uh, made of cork. It's not one of the new lightweight ones. Is it complete? Let's make sure you're on the office, bro. Well, sir, you've got plants packed in balloons to see a boat before the motor. Now, we've got a float the pontoon to put the plants on the top. We are talking about a 70 foot obstacle. You don't look like you've got the right number of pontoons. So that's less than I've got. Of course, sir. Ponies are going back for more. Chaps, this is not really me with confidence. How long are they going to be? Now, half an hour should have everything here by then. And the bombardment is due to lift in just a few minutes. Well, we can make a start with this. We might even get all the way. I'm in your hands for that. Not dealt with this equipment before. But we'll come here. At least my section under Corporal Jones. Here, Will. They're about 20 yards that way, on the bank. We've just put them in position. But, sir, we need help with this. We can't do this all ourselves. He's all we are. There's only six of us. I might have known this was coming. Look, my platoon is already down to 18 men. Out of 30, that is. 
Very good, sir. Look, let me take this and build a raft and get the Lewis across. If you, if you, if you can give me enough smoke, I'm up here to make it across in one piece. Still, well, I have some smoke here. Does anyone have any more? And there's no breeze, so you might get some cover from it, Kirk. The ammo situation is all the more reason for me to do this, sir. We have to get the momentum going again. Now, let me go. No, I'm not going to stop you, Mr. Kirk. But I need you to wait until we have more news on the bridge. Has it all gone? Wait! The smoke's clearing a bit! No! Some's still there and the anchors are in place still this time! What about the injured man? Can you still see him? No! Can't we hear him either! Think you are on the sun! We left him on the bank near the water's edge! Can't see him sir! The smoke's too thick! Right. I'm going. I'll get across and I'll get the Lewis across too. I'll need to take all the ammo. I hope you're tired enough sir. Carry ammo if you like. Oh, good man. Now, we've all got it over here. Take it across and put it together, and then we can use it as cover to get to the canal. You ready? Yes, sir. We'll Good luck, Kirky. Look after the Bosch, Kirky, if you know what I mean. We're going to score a goal. Still this match off, eh? Yes, sir. We will, sir. What gears on the bridge, Sergeant Major? We've got it, sir. It's all here. We've got a few more pioneers from Mr. Kirk, but two. We'll keep them all over there. I can't afford to have us all bunched up together. One shell will take us out. Can you get some more men up on the bank to observe and maybe give possible coverage? Why don't we send some of Kirky's boys up? They'll have more ammo. Once the bridge is over, we'll just start beating men across as quick as we can. Yes. Sergeant Major, get as many of Mr. Kirk's platoon up there to give covering fire. Very good, sir. Let me take the rest of the bridge up. Hopefully I'll pick up Kirky's go boys going across. All right, good. Confident we can do this, sir? Yes, I am, Baldy. Yes, I am. We haven't got much further to go. I hope you're right, because I'm just about done in. Well, we all are. Yeah, we're all near the end of our endurance, but we haven't got to go much further. The end is in sight. But you are one of the strong, positive ones. You keep us around going, you know. He keeps me going, sir. He keeps us all going. But what about his poetry? What does it do for you? Well, it's not part of our lives, if you know what I mean. It's something not talked about, even embarrassing. But once you've started bringing it out across that bridge, it seems it means everything. Well, everything? Well... No, well, there's no need to try and explain, old chap. I know it's hard to do that. Well, it's hard to do anything under these conditions. Yes, sir. There are things that link us to the outside, going on leave, let us home, but those things are not real. Men even dread them. Well, we are the same, you know, officers. I know that now, through Mr. Owen, because he lives with us, like us, but beyond that, we can't. Come on in! Ah! Hey, listen! Go, Kirby! You hear that, sir? That's Kirby, it's got the Lewis going. Go, Kirby! You're not coming on charge of Mr. Coordination, though, sir. No, I'm not, young Baldy. No, I'm not. Private Baldwin. If Mr. Kirk can cross this canal on his own, we all can. Well, go, Kirky! Go, Kirky! Come on, man! Give me the 
No mockeries now for them. No prayers, nor bells, nor any sound of voice of warning save the choirs. The shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles cool. calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The colour of girls' brows shall be their pall. The flowers, the tenderness of patient minds. And each slow dusk, a drawing down a blind. You are right, Jacko? He's gone. <coughs> and not a soul. He is. That poem came from his soul, and now he's gone. It's not the end yet, Baldy. <coughs> I want more. What else you got there? <coughs> this one's addressed to a beautiful woman. Oh, at last. A love poem <laughs> to his lover. <laughs> Have you got any water? Nah, got some rum somewhere. But forget it. Get another poem. Right. This one, this one says any beautiful woman, and then crossed out separate greater love. Well, read it then, you silly booger. Stop boogering about. <coughs> red lips are not so red as the stained stones kissed by the English dead. Kindness of the wooed and wooer seems shame to their love pure. O oh, love, your eyes lose lure when I behold eyes blinded in my stead. Your slender attitude trembles not exquisite like limbs knife skewed, rolling and rolling there where God seems not to care. To the fierce love they bear cramps them in death's extreme decrepitude. Your voice sings, not so soft. Though even as winds murmuring through raftered loft, your dear voice is not so dear, gentle and even and clear. As theirs who none now hear, the earth has stopped their piteous mouths and coughed. Heart, 
you were never hot, nor large, nor great, but hearts make great with shock. And though your hand be pale, paler, o'er all which trail, your cross through flame and hail. Weep. You may weep, for you may touch them not. What does it mean, Jacko? Baldy, you were the one who brought us these poems. You wanted us to read them. <coughs> so you tell me, <coughs> what's it all about? <coughs> one word, Jacko. One word. Love. Of a woman? No, I think not. I think it's of you and I and them and all those, all those countless numbers that have gone before. Jacko, this is it. Remember you said, he has given us faith but not hope. Well, the love is the hope. The love he holds for each other. The love he holds for us. Remember, he said that, didn't he? He loved us. Well done, you old booger. You should go to university. <laughs> Perhaps you will. But I reckon you're right. Because don't forget, love lives on after death. What? In our spirit? Well, yeah, in our spirit. And also in those we love. And those who love us. Piteous fools that we are. Whose mouths are cut. <laughs> Medic, stranger party needed help! <coughs> Wilfred? He's gone, sir. We well, had so much. He gave so much. You've got his poems, sir. Well, don't lose them, whatever you do. His family will need those. All right, sir. We've got word that the uh, Lanks Bridge is over across at Oars. We'll have to use that one. The company's assembling in the trees. Well, come on, old man.
Maybe they'll announce it on the streets, Mother. It should be. The papers say it should be today. Hopefully we'll hear from Wilfred. It may be days, weeks even, before they come home. I fear we will have a long wait. Maybe not so long, Mother. Oh, let it be good news. Wait, Mary. Telegram, Mum. Thank you very much. Sit down, Mother. Mary, please will you get the folder of Wilfrid's poems from off the desk? After the blast of lightning from the east, the flourish of loud clouds, the chariot throne. After the drums of time have rolled and ceased, and by the bronze west long retreat is blown. Shall life renew these bodies? Of a truth all death he will annul, all tears assuage. Or fill these void veins full again with youth. Or wash with immortal water age. Mother? Mother? It says, it's my painful duty to inform you that the Imperial War Office has this day received a report that your son, Wilfred Edward Salter Owen, has been killed in battle. It's the armistice! The war is over! The no. war is over! Mother, mother, listen! before you took him. But now it is over. And maybe you have come back to take him. You forgot him last year. But now...
It was said that after the armistice, colleagues of Wilfred visited his family. This must have been a great comfort to them in their loss. For his part in the Battle of the Sombre Waz Canal, the last for the 96th Brigade, and including the 2nd Manchester Battalion, 2nd Lieutenant James Kirk was awarded the posthumous Victoria Cross. Lieutenant Wilfred Owen was awarded the Military Cross for an earlier action. The spirit of soldiers like Jacko lived on, still does in every British soldier from then till now. The mocking, ironic humour, the endurance and generosity, generosity shown by laying down your life for others. The love shown by that. Just as Private Jackson had predicted, men that survived the war came home broken by it and found the world had moved on, adding venom to the almighty question, why did we fight and who did we fight for? As a soldier, when called to fight, how do you answer these questions? It has been said the first casualty of war is truth. Wilfred's poetry showed that. He did not say it meant to stop fighting or refuse to fight himself. He merely showed the pity of this war for each and every soldier. Now a soldier is no longer a, number, a target for a shell or a shot, dying like cattle. They must be granted a privilege of a truth so strong that it cannot become the first casualty of war. Is this part of Wilfred's legacy? His poetry survived through the gathering of manuscripts, scraps and papers by his mother and others. Let us celebrate now and meet again his family and those he shared his last days with. It's been my utter pleasure and privilege to be working with these guys, girls, for the last few weeks and months. And I include those at the back, those at the sides, those above, those who sometime, who were, were here at the beginning and for various reasons left, those who joined late and very, very quickly grasped what we were trying to do and bought into it in a magnificent way. Some people who were in hospital, had partners in hospital, and came back and, and did their thing in, in, in a just a wonderful way. Um, and uh, I think itself is a, a tribute to the centenary that we're in, um, that they did this. I knew that we were onto something really good when I was invited to the pub one day by a couple of these guys, and I got there, and I found them with the scripts out, calling each other by their stage name, and I thought, yes, we got them here. Um, so, um, you know, and um, I, I, they, they've been absolutely wonderful, but more of that in a minute. But none of this could have happened without the overarching umbrella of global fusion. And I don't know if you... Uh...
but he's not. And he's oh, thank you. We're glad to know you're not mad. Oh, yeah. Okay. And he produced a, a really excellent production of life. It's been very entertaining, very poignant, and very sympathetic and empathetic of Wilfred's life uh, as it was short lived and when he died in all. But I'd also like to thank the cast, because each one of the cast has really performed wonderfully this evening. And I couldn't have, uh, the trouble is that Wilfred looks like Wilfred. <laughs> <laughs> He's very hard. And I'm sure he married up. And, and Susan is also fairly stern. <laughs> But it has been an excellent evening, and I thank Bob Fanshaw and the whole cast and Global Fusion for doing what they have done. Thank you very much. Bob may tell me otherwise. But we want to stay, don't we, old booger? Yeah. Be louder, lad. Do we or do we not want to stay in here by the final show of this war? Yeah. Okay, no, that's that's a bit too common. Yeah. I think. Make <laughs> 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 eye contact with yeah. him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a nice thing. Uh, okay, I think that's that's it for today.